my name is Denise Lucy, and I am a professor of business and leadership here at Dominican University and the director of the Institute for Leadership Studies. And it's, it is my privilege to welcome you tonight to our beautiful campus. And thank you again for coming. If this is not your, for, if this is your first visit with us, I hope you will return. And for many of you I know I've seen, please, please keep, continue to join us. The Institute for Leadership Studies is in partnership with Book Passage for several of these lectures. And without their support, we could not bring the kind of luminary speakers that we've been able to bring to our campus. So please do, if you can, join us tonight and, and let's patronize Book Passage and buy a book from, from, about Dr. Goldman's ideas and, and we'll be able to continue our project together. Elaine and Bill Petricelli couldn't be here tonight because they are in Italy enjoying themselves, but they also wanted to welcome you. I also wanted to thank Marin Magazine, which is our media sponsor, and we are very thankful to them for their support. But the lecture series is the public face for the Institute for Leadership Studies, which is a leadership development center. It is a consortium of students, faculty, and staff with business and community leaders committed to leadership development practice and opportunities. We seek to facilitate positive individual, organizational, and social change, engaged citizenship, and socially responsible leadership. What a perfect topic tonight that matches our, our mission. The lecture series brings to Dominican some of the country's leading figures from world politics, the arts, entertainment, academe, and literature. The series also provides the, the university to share its wonderful resources with members of our community. So thank you so much for joining us. This is actually the last night of finals week, so we don't have as many of our students on campus, but usually these lectures will include our students and our faculty. We are honored to welcome Dr. Daniel Goleman this evening. And as a professor of leadership, I'm just so thrilled to have him here tonight because I use his work in my teaching and in my scholarship. It's just a thrill. His book on emotional intelligence has changed, really has really changed the world of leadership development and in training. His newest book, Ecological Intelligence, is of significance to all of us. And most especially to many of our audience, where our Green MBA students are here tonight and Green, Green MBA faculty. In fact, we own that name, Green MBA. Dominican University's Green MBA is the first a Green MBA, and it's in its ninth year. And it is my great privilege to introduce to you the co-founder of that program, John Staten, who is going to introduce our, our speaker. John earned his MBA here in international business at Dominican, and it is just a thrill to have him as a colleague and please welcome Mr. John Staten. You may wonder why someone who helped coin the term Green MBA is introducing the author of a book with a second chapter titled Green is a Mirage. <laughs> However, I fully agree with Daniel Goleman's premise that green is often used to disguise products that are fundamentally harmful but have a narrow green attribute. The Green MBA was fundamentally designed from scratch as a comprehensive leadership development program for sustainability change agents. Our holistic approach to leadership development includes Dr. Goleman's earlier work on emotional intelligence as part of our curriculum. There are now about 15 programs in the U.S. calling themselves Green MBAs, and many of them have business-as-usual curricula, which really was a big part of the environmental, um, social, and economic crises that we face now. But they have a few green courses that provide window dressing, um, basically providing cover for their use of the label green. So in business education, green is also often a mirage. Daniel Goleman was born in Stockton, California. He, re he studied at both Amherst College and UC Berkeley as an undergraduate. He received his PhD from Harvard, where he has also been a visiting lecturer. 
Dr. Goleman is an internationally known psychologist who lectures frequently to professional groups and business audiences. Working as a science journalist, he reported on the brain and behavioral sciences for the New York Times for many years. In his 1999, 1995 book, Emotional Intelligence, he earned a place on the New York Times bestseller list for 18 months. More than five million copies of that book are now in print worldwide in 30 languages. His latest book is really down our alley in the Green MBA, Ecological Intelligence, How Knowing the Hidden Impacts of What We Buy Can Change Everything. In this book, Dr. Goleman reveals the hidden environmental consequences of what we make and buy and shows how new market forces can drive the essential changes we all must make to save our planet. Ecological intelligence draws on cutting edge research to reveal why green is a mirage, illuminates inconsistencies in our response to the ecological crisis, and introduces new technologies that reveal with radical transparency the eco-impact of products we buy, with the potential to drive consumers to make smarter decisions and companies to reform their business practices. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Goleman. Hello there. Nice to see you this evening. Thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm going to ask the person in charge of the house lights to turn them up because I actually like to see the faces of the people I'm talking to. And uh, now I'll know if you're falling asleep, so watch out. So I'm really happy to be here uh, in Marin because, as you heard, I grew up in Stockton, the lesser Greater Bay Area. And <laughs> I always thought that the ideal life was actually to live in Mill Valley, and I haven't uh, quite gotten there yet, but I, maybe one day. So tonight I want to share with you some uh, bad news, and then some worse news, and then some good news, and then some really better news. So bear with me if it sounds a little glum at the beginning. I want to reflect on stuff, on the things we buy, the things we use every day, and how it matters, and how we haven't really known how it matters, and how it matters that we haven't known how it matters, if you follow me. I just got a, uh, I just received today this um, CD set, which is uh, a series of conversations that I did on this topic, one with a f local guy named Michael Lerner, who's uh, over in Bolinas. He has something called Commonweal, about the uh, hidden health impacts of um, the things we buy, the, the chemical stew that I, I'm going to talk about in more detail. And also two of my personal heroes who are here tonight and who I'm going to introduce you to later this evening. One is Dara O'Rourke who is revolutionizing uh, our ability to matter, to make a difference in, uh, in the world of the environment and how businesses treat the environment and our health and the people that work for them. I'll explain this more later. My other personal hero who's here is Gregory Norris, who is helping companies uh, do it better get their supply chain under control in ways that will make the world a better place. And that will all become clear. But the reason I want to talk about it is I noticed that there's this little insert in the CD set. You can't see it, but it's, it shows the life cycle of the CD. And the idea that products have a life cycle is one of the key concepts I, I want to leave you with tonight. You know, this, this involved trees, waters, aluminum mines, polycarbonate plastic lacquer dyes. There was a paper mill, a uh, CD manufacturer, trucks taking it here and there, a printer, a replicator, uh, and then you, if you end up with this. And then it says, this is the part I really like, it says, the rest of this CD set's life is up to you. After listening to Ecological Awareness, that's the name of the series, for 100 years, the estimated viability of the CDs themselves. This is a little tongue-in-cheek. 
you can either throw it away or recycle it. In a landfill, the packaging will biodegrade in a few months, aluminum may take 200 years, and the plastic perhaps 450 years. While it decomposes, the plastic will leach uh, BPA, an essential ingredient of polycarbonate and a known endocrine disruptor. Yet, happily, the paper is 100% recyclable, and the CDs are too. So that's really where I want to go to the happily part of the story and how we can make it more happy more often. But let me ask you, what are some of the things you do to help the environment? I mean, how many people, how many people recycle? Oh, oh, this is Marin, of course. <laughs> I've never seen a show of hands like that anywhere in the country, but I should have known. Uh, someone else uh, before we started was saying my church is having an active discussion of whether we should use styrofoam plates or not. What are some of the other things that you do? Just, I'd just like to hear. Compost, Compost okay. You bike to work, yeah? What about my yard planted vegetables? Planted vegetables in your yard? Solar panels, Solar panels something else? You clean with vinegar and baking soda and elbow grease. You didn't mention that part. Yeah. Farmer's markets. Water filter. Fluorescent bulbs, of course. Come on. Yeah. OK. I'm sure we could go on all evening. This is Marin. But the point I want to make is this. Uh, one of my personal heroes, Greg Norris, who you're going to hear from later tonight, was asked by Stonyfield yogurt. Anybody eat Stonyfield yogurt? They have it out here. It's from uh, Maine. He was asked to examine their ecological impact of Stonyfield yogurt. So of those of you who are yogurt eaters, how many are yogurt eaters? And do you all recycle the plastic? This is Marin, of course you do. So, Okay, that's great, but then what Greg found is that if you look at the overall impact of a yogurt, and Stonyfield, by the way, is perhaps the most virtuous, ec ecologically virtuous yogurt company in America, 5% of the ecological impact uh, is in the disposal phase, the part you have control over. 95% is elsewhere. It's in the manufacture and the transport and the retail. And that is my point. Right now, the focus has been on what we can do, the, the behaviors we can change, all to the good. Everything that we do helps. But if you look, if you were to put in one hand all of the pluses from the things we do to help the environment and so on, and then you were to put in the other hand the ecological impacts of everything we buy, all that stuff in our house, the things we use every, every day and so on, the other hand is immeasurably greater. For a yogurt, it's 20 times greater. So the good news is there's a next step. And the next step is for us, you and me, to take control of the impacts of what we buy. And that's really what ecological intelligence is about. And the reason we can do it is because of a new discipline. It's a discipline that both uh, Greg Norris and, and Dara O'Rourke uh, are members of. It's called industrial ecology. Industrial ecology looks at industry as an ecosystem. And then it looks at how industry impacts nature's ecosystems. And it, it's a field made up of quants. It's a field of engineers, of industrial designers, of chemists, of biologists, of scientists. And they quantify those impacts. So for example, uh, they, they've come up with a new math. It's a kind of ecological accounting. Greg did an analysis of the, um, of the Dutch power grid, you know, the PG&E over in the Netherlands. <coughs> and uh, he used a, a unit that's, that'll give you a sense of the kinds of things they're looking at. It's called a disability adjusted life year. What's a disability adjusted life year? It's how many years of life you lose to a disease or disability, or you live with a disability. And I'm getting nervous now because Greg, is, this is the first time I've ever talked about this with Greg right in the audience, maybe the second time at Harvard you were there, yeah. So uh, anyway, I'll do my best. But what he found was this. 
If you look at the negative impacts on the health of the people in the Netherlands from their power company, you know, coal plants, emissions, respiratory disease, and you convert that to a DALI, disability adjusted life here, and then you look at the 10% of the supply chain for the power grid that has factories in the poorest parts of the world, and you look at the health benefits from better nutrition for kids, better education, better health, it turns out that the positive health impacts of that power grid far outweigh the negatives to the people in the Netherlands. In other words, what industrial ecology does is open our eyes to the nuances of the consequences of the things we buy and use. And that information is power when it's in our hands. I did an op-ed. I don't know how many of you folks read the Sunday Times? Few hands. I used to work for the Times. I'm sorry to see so few hands here in Marin, one of our former prime target markets. But anyway, the, <laughs> the um, op-ed was one I wrote with Greg, and it asked the question, is it better to use a stainless steel reusable water bottle or to just get throwaway plastic ones? This is an important question. So we didn't go into BPA. BPA is that toxin that, that was mentioned. But we, what, we, what Greg did, actually, uh, is to, did we, did we think about BPA? Oh yeah, we, they wouldn't give us the space for the E. Okay, anyway, that's, that's just between us, don't, uh, that's just in this room, okay. Oh, and, and people on the radio and streamed on the web and so on, okay. So there are no secrets. Transparency is another key point I want to make. So, <clears throat> so we, it turns out that a single plastic bottle, in terms of its ecological impact, in this new math, ecological accounting, is better than a single stainless steel bottle. Okay, why? What? People are murmuring. Did I say something upsetting? That's upsetting? <laughs> no, wait, wait, there's more to the story. <laughs> Don't throw them out yet, you won't get the punchline. So, <clears throat> so why is stainless so bad? Well, one reason is that to make steel stainless steel, you have to take pig iron and you have to add nickel and you have to add a chromium and chromium actually is a carcinogen uh, as, as raw ore and it's mined in places like, this is not a joke, in places like Kazakhstan and India and South Africa where there may not be the best safeguards for workers' health. So there may be a very large for example, negative impact to the people who make it uh, in stainless steel. There's also the fact that to make the steel, you have to have a, a fire of, what, thousands of degrees for 48, no, for how long? For a long time. Do either of you know how long offhand? I don't want to put you on the spot. For, apparently, our technical people say for a very long time. <laughs> so, so that has its problems. However, when you get to the fifth plastic bottle you didn't use, you start to tip the equation toward the stainless. The first thing that you do is even the ledger on non-renewables. If you get to 20 or 25, you have evened the ledger on the major environmental impacts. And if you get to 500, if you're very conscientious about this, and you probably should wash it a couple of times in between those 500. If you get to 500, every ecological impact, and there are hundreds, tip toward the stainless. The last two to go are metal depletion. Metal depletion is very interesting. Where is the metal in a plastic bottle? Nowhere, right? The fact is the metal is somewhere in the supply chain because this new math this new way of accounting on ecological impacts looks at products not as entities but as processes. There, if, you, if you talk about a uh, glass jar like pasta sauce might come in, uh, industrial ecologists break down making that the life cycle, which includes getting the ingredients, concocting them, manufacture, transport, uh, time in store, time we use it, 
uh, disposal. And so those are all major life phases for a product. But each one of those can be broken down into smaller steps. So for the glass bottle, there are 1,959 discrete steps that can be analyzed. Every step can be analyzed for environmental impacts, for health impacts. What does health impacts mean? Well, what chemicals are used? What molecules are, are going to be in this? Are they going to, uh, are workers exposed to it? When it's in our house, uh, is, are those molecules off-gassing and creating a toxic atmosphere uh, inside the house? Answer, yes. We'll get to that later. Uh, another is social impacts. Like, for example, do people benefit because of better nutrition, better education, or is this made in a sweatshop? Things like that. So the, the math gets very complex, very intricate, and very sophisticated. So you don't look at, if you're looking through the eyes of industrial ecology, this is not a bottle, this is not a product, it's a process. And we need to weight the value of this with all of the ecological impacts of that process. And this gets us to where the power lies. The big dilemma we face is this. The major industrial platforms and processes and industrial chemicals used were almost entirely developed in an age when nobody was looking at ecological impacts. How old is industrial ecology? Not more than one or two decades, right? It's a very new discipline. So the data hasn't even existed. That means that the stuff we buy, the stuff that's made for us, was invented and developed in an era when no one knew about or cared about ecological impacts. Now that we know or can know those impacts, we have to reassess everything. In fact, what I argue is we have to reinvent everything. And since this is Marin, I will point out that this is a huge entrepreneurial opportunity to reinvent everything. That's like big. big. I think it's the next big, actually. So we have this vast legacy and a vast entrepreneurial opportunity. How do we get into this mess? in the first place, and this is the more bad news. It turns out that evolution did not design our brain to detect any of the ecological threats we face today. It designed our brain to detect threats that were physical threats, you know, snarling saber-toothed tigers, not molecules off-gassing in the living room, not even global warming, because that's on such a vast scale, we don't directly sense it, we hear about it. We don't directly sense the chemicals uh, in, in the things we buy that threaten our health because they're too subtle. So we have these paradoxes. For example, there's a chemical in sunblock, I'm told, that washes off us. I don't know if you ever snorkel, like you, know, you go to Hawaii and see a nice coral reef or something. But there's a substance in the sunblock that washes off you while you're looking at the reef that promotes the growth of a virus and an algae that kills the reef. We don't know that. I mean, we're not designed to know that. There's a chemical in some sunscreens, Dara tells me, that actually turns out to become a carcinogen when exposed to the sun. Who knew? There's a chemical in water wings, phthalates, it's a softener of plastic, that is uh, a nasty chemical in the body, and this is a really sad one. I've got grandchildren. It is absorbed most readily by wet skin. I mean, we're doing this to ourselves, and we're doing it because we've developed all of these products with a veil of ignorance. And uh, just to give you a little more bad news, there are about 100,000. It's going to get better. Don't give up, really. But there are about uh, 100,000 industrial chemicals in use in the, in the products we buy and manufacturing processes. In 1970-something, when the EPA was created, 63,000 were grandfathered in as presumably non-toxic. Presumably non-toxic. Doesn't bother me. I sell the stuff, right? So we have this 
uh, chemical stew that is part of everything we, we buy that um, the old model of toxicology doesn't seem to be very good at evaluating in the first place because the standard toxicology model is you look at one chemical and you expose lab rats or some biological entity to it and you see if it, it creates problems, if it causes a disease and so on. But the new understanding, and this is very recent, uh, is that chemicals that may look fine when tested singly can be extremely toxic in combination. And the more bad news, and, and this um, I heard from Michael Lerner uh, out at uh, Commonweal in Bolinas, he said that he and his wife had been tested for what's called body burden. Body burden is an assay that tells you how many not really so great chemicals you're carrying in your body. And it turns out there's nobody on the planet that doesn't have a body burden of several hundred bad chemicals. Why? Because there is no away. When we throw stuff away, where does it go? It goes to someone else's here. I was talking to Gary Hirschberg, uh, who's a CEO of Stonyfield Yogurt, and he said at one point, uh, their local town told them they could no longer handle their liquid sludge waste. And so Gary says to the guy that ran the uh, facility, so where sh what should we do with it? He said, take it to Vermont. He was in New Hampshire. <laughs> that was his away. But you know, it all comes back to us because it's all so interconnected. So we have this chemical stew, which has many, many chemicals of concern that are in stuff that we buy every day and the things that fill our house. So don't give up because I'm about to get to the good news. And the good news is there are now brand new information systems designed and developed by the two fellows, my heroes I'm going to introduce to you later, that level the playing field. We've existed in an atmosphere of what economists called information asymmetry. That means sellers know things about a product that buyers do not. Think what? Toxic assets, subprime mortgages. Who knew? Somebody knew. But there's a trillion dollar market at one point. That's what caused our current meltdown. Now take that toxic assets and think toxic goods. What's in the stuff we buy? Now we can know, and one reason we can know is because of a wonderful uh, information system called Good Guide. Not good guy, like good gal, good guy. Good Guide, G-U-I-D-E dot com, which evaluates the entire ecological footprint of products for us on their environmental impact, their health impact, that is bad chemicals and so on, and their social impact. How were the people who made this treated, for example? And it it aggregates this very complex data from actually 200 databases, and it gives us the answer in one single number, like a, a 10 point scale. 10 is the best, one is the worst. Do you go to zero? You go to zero. Oh man, I don't want to go near that, whatever that is. So uh, we can know, uh, this is a free app on the iPhone, by the way, or you can take your weekly shopping list and the things you buy most often, check it out on Good Guide. I, I just I was having dinner last night with some friends in San Anselmo. I was talking about Good Guide, and there was a 14-year-old in, in the family, and he immediately got Good Guide up on the family you know, entertainment center, the giant screen in the kitchen, and we played this game of, hey, check out my deodorant. No, my shampoo. And, and we're looking at all this stuff. I had the most depressing time because, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I, I'm not going to mention brand names, but I've been using that stuff for decades. And so... Each of us found either, yes, we've got a winner, or oh my god, and found easily, in, in a given price range, what is better ecologically. And guess what? We all got in the car and we went to this Walgreens over here at, on, where is Third Street or somewhere? I don't know. And uh, we each bought our ecological upgrades. I mean, I think this should be a party game everybody plays with their friends. <laughs> so. Good Guide makes that possible, and its, its complement is designed by my good friend Gregory 
Norris. It's called Erster, and it's for companies because companies are seeing that the future is uh, radically transparent when it comes to ecological impacts. That is, for the first time, not only can companies know their ecological impacts, shoppers will know. That changes the game completely because to the extent each one of us shops with this in mind, we're going to shift market share toward the good guys. And everybody wants to be the good guys. You know, companies need to protect their brand reputation. So companies are starting to look very seriously at where can we get better this is or that. This is why it's a great entrepreneurial opportunity because the entire supply chain, which is vast, that's world business. This is a global, global phenomenon. Uh, where can you find a factory that can get you at a good cost, good enough cost, an ecological upgrade? And that's what Erster is designed to do, to match good suppl better suppliers with companies that want better supplies. And I'm going to ask each of them to explain what they do in more detail, but think about it. To the extent each of us does three simple things when we shop. First, know the impacts of what you buy. Uh, goodguide.com, I recommend that state of the art. If you're getting personal care products and you want to be sure they don't have toxic chemicals, there's uh, something called skindeep.com that uh, takes, as Good Guy does, by the way, takes every ingredient, you know, there's like 50 things in your shampoo, who knows what any of them are. It takes each one of those and looks in medical databases to see, well, is this an endocrine disruptor? Is it a carcinogen? Uh, you know, does it lower sperm count? Does it do this? Does it do that? And it weights accordingly uh, the chemicals and then ranks products according to what's best and what's safest and what's like, um, you shouldn't buy this stuff, really. I found something very interesting. I looked at their shampoos and I looked at the 10 safest and the 10 worst and the most expensive shampoo on that list was among the 10 worst. Not only that, it, was in, it had this very like eco label and a very green sounding botanical name. It just looks so green. But what you have to realize, as was pointed out, green is a mirage. We have been marketed green as a, you know, a fabrication. If you, if you see that there are a thousand impacts, environmental, health, uh, social to any product and then some company takes one thing out of a thousand and makes it better and calls it green well what about the other 999 I got a uh, organic cotton t-shirt here actually in Marin at a store I will not name and I thought well this is really great and then I started to do the research for my book and I realized a couple of things. One is that it turns out that organic cotton actually is harder to work with than non-organic cotton because the strands aren't as long, some technical thing. They have to grow more to get the same unit textile fabric. Not only that, but cotton is a very thirsty crop. It could take 2,000 liters of water to grow the cotton for one t-shirt and because of the climate cotton needs it's often grown in water scarce parts of the world. The Aral Sea in Asia has shrunk immeasurably because of overuse of that water for cotton plantations. So it's nice that it's organic but what about the water? And then what about the dye? It's a blue t-shirt and it turns out that many textile dyes are carcinogens. It's been known for decades in public health that workers in dye houses have higher rates of leukemia. So that wasn't helped by the fact that it's organic. What we need to do is look at the total picture, like Good Guide will do for us, and then get upgrades. And here's something I love about Good Guide, you can do two things. So first is know your impacts, second is favor improvements, and the third is share what you know. Twitter while you shop, put it on your Facebook page. You know, once you find out, you want people you care about to know. And that will make the magnitude of what you've learned have a multiplier effect. And then if you do number four, email the company. 
Good Guide has a little one-click uh, feature that lets you send an email to the company to say, you know, I'm heartbroken. I have loved your deodorant, deodorant for X years. In my case, it's a big number of years, like <laughs> more than some of you are old, I assure you. And I, I just found out today that you have this in it and that in it and that in it, and I wish you would change because I still like your product, but I can't buy it till you get rid of that stuff. Those emails have a certain power. It turns out if a company gets like three or four complaints about something, it's handled at a low level. Uh, for some companies, there's a standard policy. If we get more than 500 customers complaining about this, it is seen at the highest executive level. I don't know if you remember, a couple of months ago, Tropicana redesigned its packaging. Uh, it used to be very distinctive. You, could, you knew which was the high calcium and the no pulp and so on. And then they did some weird packaging where you couldn't figure out what was what, and they got a storm of complaints. And guess what? They're back to the old packaging. Because companies spend billions of dollars figuring out what we want, because they want to sell it to us. So if we let them know we want ecological footprints to matter, it's going to matter in how they operate. And I, I have this on very, very good but entirely confidential sources that some of the biggest retailers in this country are already assuming that this is going to happen and are looking 10 years ahead to make sure that they're the first in their industry, the first in their sector to be the ecological good guys. And it makes good marketing sense. And that's important because companies today are in this quandary. There, there are voices inside that are saying our operations need to be sustainable. It's the socially responsible thing to do. And then there are voices that say, yeah, but we can't make a profit doing that. And our first responsibility is fiduciary to our shareholders. We've got to make a profit. And so it stops right there. But as markets start to shift, to change, then we create a virtuous cycle where customers speak by what they buy and stop buying. Companies listen, and they start talking to people like Gregory Norris about how they can upgrade their supply chain so they can stay competitive because that's what we want and then they sell us better stuff and then we raise the bar because now everybody's doing that so the next thing you've got to do is improve this and we have a perpetual upgrade uh, process going on in companies and that's why I'm really hopeful so that's that's where I'm going to pause now I'm going to put me on pause and I'm going to ask Dara to come up and talk about Good Guide, which I think is really exciting. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. I'm incredibly honored and excited to be here. First, to be included in Dan's book. Dan obviously is one of, I think, the world's best trend spotters and experts on pattern recognition, identifying very early the way things are moving in the world. So uh, we're excited to be included in this assessment and his framing of where this movement really is moving. I'm also really excited because nerds like Greg and I almost never get let out of our laboratories. <laughs> so it's kind of a special occasion to be even in public uh, to talk about this. Um, we basically, I'm a professor at UC Berkeley and we've been working for about the last decade, first at MIT where I taught and taught with Greg and then at Berkeley doing research on global supply chains and advancing academic methods for understanding these environmental social health impacts of the products we consume and the deep supply chains and complex supply chains behind those. What we've tried to do over the last three years is turn that fairly academic, esoteric, and nerdy and geeky information into something actually useful for the public. So we have um, tried to build a set of tools, and this is really an experiment, in trying to deliver information to the public in the easiest, simplest, and free form that allows them to make better decisions. And by better, we mean both decisions which are scientifically better and decisions which better match your own values, what you care about, what you're concerned about. We have a website called goodguide.com. It's a beta site. Um, we have an iPhone app, which I'll show you. And basically, what we're trying to do is to go from these years of research we've done to literally in one click to get you to better information. So the main way people get this is they browse so to personal care products uh, or to food, in this case. To look at, um, 
looks like the order is messed up here, but we'll go through. So to find a food product, this is a Horizon Organic Strawberry Milk, which sounds good. It turns out this actually is a not very good product. Um, it has 31 grams of sugar in an 8-ounce cup of milk, which is more than a can of Coke, actually. And there are things that you just wouldn't know about your product, about the nutrition facts, the health facts, chemicals of concern, additives, food colors that have been banned in Europe, chemical ingredients in personal care products. So Dan mentioned he found a deodorant, which I'll go to. I won't name any names, but this is Dan's deodorant. <laughs> um, and what we try to do is to, to, to go deep and, to, as he said, to find, are there any carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive health hazards in this product? And as a normal consumer, you can barely read the back of the label if they include it at all. What we've done is take that data and then analyze it across about 60 international hazard lists to have a full health hazard assessment, a full environmental impact assessment from toxics releases from the factory that produced it to carbon impacts, carbon disclosure, EPA fines and violations, to the social impacts. Do they have women and minority in senior management position? Do they test on animals? How do they treat their workers in their supply chain? What's their policy on treatment of gay and lesbian employees? Basically anything that you would possibly want to know about a product, we want to get to the public in a simple, accessible form, and then allow you to filter it through your own personal preferences. So we're not trying to tell people to live the way I do and my choices, but rather you tell me what you care about and we'll try to get you the best data that we can to help you make that decision. We also, um, as Dan pointed out, can point you, so if Dan finds out his deodorant doesn't do so well, we can point you towards better rated deodorants. Um, also, I don't have inter internet access up, but you can then contact the company. You can email this to your friends, you can share it on Facebook, you can do things with this information to take action, not only for yourself, a personal consumption choice, but also to try to hopefully move the market. We're really interested in getting this information out in a form and working with other groups that are moving companies towards less toxics, less carbon, less sweatshops, the things we all want out of these products. Um, this is very early, we're very interested in feedback on it and people using it and telling us how to make it better. Um, we are doing life cycle assessment work on these products and trying to get down um, to understanding what's really behind the full environmental impacts of it. We're very early in this and this is where we're really looking to experts like Greg and research that's going on in academia, in some industries quite frankly, in the labs behind closed doors where companies are now trying to really understand the full impacts of their products. We're trying to get that data and push it out to the public and put it in an accessible form. It's really a key step and a step that we're working with people like Earthster on. Um, as Dan has mentioned, we have an iPhone app. This makes it free and easy. Anyone has an iPhone, we're going to be putting this on other platforms soon. In a store where you're actually shopping for your deodorant or shampoo or your baby, whatever it is, we want to give it instantly in a store. You can find this information. You can find out chemicals of concern. You can find out what you care about. Add it to a shopping list. Add it to an avoid list. Contact the company. Um, basically to take action out in the marketplace. All of us are spending billions of dollars and uh, often not knowing the impacts on our own health, on our family's health, our children's health, the environment, society, things that all of us care a lot about and work on in the rest of our life, but we're trying to basically give a window onto this to allow people to vote with their dollars and, and uh, hopefully move the market. So I'll stop there and we can go back on details if you want to. Hi, Greg Morris here, and uh, I, with Dara, I really share a huge appreciation to be here tonight with Dan, uh, appreciation for what he's doing with, uh, with the book and, and his, and his uh, speaking series. Also, frankly, just in, uh, awe and appreciation to be, to be part of the, the movement um, doing this work and, and uh, part of the, really the human uprising to, to, to trying to get uh, these changes happening. I'm going to see what I need to do to get, uh, there we go. Um, but Dan mentioned that uh, he was a little nervous to, to speak uh, in front of me about life cycle assessment. I think actually the, the, the more nerve wracking thing for, is for me to speak about life cycle assessment in front of Dan. He, my mother is reading his book and she tells me for the first time in my life I understand what it is that you do. <laughs> so, so I really should get Dan back up here. <laughs> but he asked me to say a few words. We, we don't have the other version of these slides. That's, we'll go with it. This will help me uh, be quick. Um, what I just was asked to do, what Dan asked me to do, is just give you a glimpse inside of this Earthster tool. 
uh, in this Earthster system. And so that's what I'll try to do. Um, this um, is a bad graphic of what we call a unit process. It's basically every business operation on Earth uh, anywhere in a supply chain. This could be a retail store. This could actually be you using the product, or this could be a steel mill, et cetera. We, in life cycle assessment, we call these unit processes, and we study uh, things that are extracted from nature, things that are released to nature, uh, usually pollutants, uh, from this unit process. We also study the connections between the unit processes. So each unit process is buying from other unit processes and selling products. <laughs> the marvels of technology, but th thanks, Dara. I guess we're going to get uh, graphically better slides. Now, companies don't want you, uh, they, they really can't. It's, it's competition sensitive information to share how much of the inputs they purchase in order to make their product. And that's been a stumbling block uh, to getting life cycle assessment information out. But ultimately, when we buy a product, we, what we really care most about is what's the total consequence over the supply chain, right? We want the total carbon footprint, the total toxic footprint. Thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Uh, you can see that's a bit better, easier for your eyes. So what we really want is this total life cycle footprint, and, uh, or at least we need that information available. Um, you can see there are over 600 different flows either extracted from nature. The, the top is the, is the beginning of the list of, of resources extracted from nature in the making of a particular product, and then we have releases to air, water, and land. Obviously, to, to stand in, you wouldn't want your iPhone to show you a list of 673 things. So. Um, the next step in life cycle assessment is to provide these focusing lenses that convert those hundreds of different flows into impacts, as Dan says, on human health, on ecosystems, and, um, and also social impacts. Now, we've been doing, actually LCA has been underway since the late 60s. Coca-Cola was the first company to ask the question, what are the total consequences of this shift we were starting to make from returnable glass bottles to one-way packaging? Um, and they basically asked some scientists to invent the, t the, t the tool of life cycle assessment in order to answer the question. Um, but still the primary way LCA is done is by consultants who build and maintain and, and, and uh, sort of cherish and hoard, you could say, their databases. That's how they, that's how they uh, make money in the economy. Unfortunately, that means that very few of us can do LCA, and they're costly, and they're time-consuming. And we really need to change that uh, and, and break this whole enterprise open or democratize it. Um, and that's what Erster is trying to demonstrate and implement using the web. So. The old model is databases that tend to be self-contained information silos, and the new model is, is combining Web 2.0 and 3.0. 2.0, as we know, turns the web into a document that we can all write in. Instead of just something we can go read as passive consumers, now users are authors, and we can take that same principle to life cycle assessment. Companies are no longer just consumers of life cycle information. They author in the life cycle information space. And with Web 3.0, uh, we make it machine readable so that essentially the web becomes a, a database. Erster is, is real, well, it's designed to be uh, relatively simple to use, not nearly as simple as the good guide, I have to confess, but this is for companies. And they go in and they say, okay, for my unit process, I'm making shampoo, what do I purchase, what do I emit, what do I extract, and, and what's my product output? They can do that for free. They don't have to pay for software anymore, and, and um, we're actually making available best publicly available data. So that's ubiquitous empowerment. It means that companies can do what if. I, I love Dan's term. They can find their ecological upgrades. Uh, they can search for suppliers of, of whatever plastic resin they're using, or maybe even say, what if we switch plastic resins? We're getting a lot of emails from Dara's customers and users need to find a different plastic resin. They can shop for um, you know, better products in their supply chain and do what-if analysis. The pie chart also shows they can, they can find out the stony field lesson. Where in our total life cycle are the big impacts happening? Perhaps we've been uh, chasing down minutiae and we've been ignoring some of the biggest impacts. Um, 
And that's a start, but frankly, the, the next two steps are where Erster really takes on its potential. Second is they can freely publish that information to the web. They don't have to, but they can. And the third interesting thing is, so can their suppliers. First, I want to emphasize companies don't want to share those unit process flows, but they can share the total footprint, which is what the consumer cares about or that the customer cares about. And sharing the total footprint doesn't divulge trade secrets. But step three is, if I can do this, so can my suppliers. And then I can use information on their products rather than using data from databases. Then my supplier will find out that, well, steel is the, is the, major, input, is the major impact in their input. So they'll pick up the phone and ask their suppliers to please publish in Erster. And um, in this way, we basically degenericize the modeling that all the companies are doing. And it shines the spotlight of radical transparency on what the companies are doing in each supply chain. And just a few things. I think Dan's book does uh, a, just a wonderful job of helping you see um, what becomes possible in this new world. And, and um, in fact, I'll just leave these up there and, and say that I'll just highlight one point that, that I think is, is really important. I think Dan mentioned it already. Right now, we, we, uh, he, he says we need to think of green as a verb. And I think that's absolutely right. You know, we, we're in a world right now where we tend to say which of these two static entities is more green. But um, that is a, is a game with a few winners and a lot of losers, and you get a lot of resistance and you might get companies resting on their laurels. If instead what we really focus on, or in addition what we focus on, is progress, continuous progress, rapid progress on the thing that's, things that matter most, that's a game every company can play. Um, and it's ultimately what we want. We want all the companies um, and participants in these global supply chains to be making as, as dramatic a progress as possible on the things that matter most. So, Thanks uh, to Dan and, and everyone for a few moments up here, and we'll turn it back over to the master. I got two pages of notes out of that, and it's not going to go in my next book, but in my next talk. I always, these, are, these are my mentors here, my gurus in this area. So I'd like to just throw this open to a conversation, and uh, if you have any questions for me or for Greg or for Dara, we're, we're here for you. So uh, what's the drill? Is there a mic, or you just yell, or... Uh, Stacy, tell me. Oh, Stacy has the mic. So Stacy is, is coming down this aisle. You raise your hand and she'll bring you the mic. Or if you have a question, uh, she'll find you. Yes. And, and you guys can use this mic to answer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Goldman. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Gale, and I had the honor of interview, interviewing you as a journalist at the time you were writing for the New York Times. I also was in the first work scholar program at Esalen Institute in Big Sur in October of 1975, where I know that you've led workshops. My question is, do you feel there will ever be radical transparency on the worldwide internet, which I personally feel is overloaded today with misinformation from many poorly educated computer programmers and bloggers? Oh, now that's interesting. It's not about product transparency. It's about the quality of information. And I think it's a very important issue. I was talking, my wife and I were out to dinner the other night uh, in New York, and her cousin said, she's a, very, you know, she's a real, like, super eco-mom. And she uses vinegar and baking soda to clean. And she said, I, I got a recipe for a laundry detergent off the web. Uh, and I now, I make my laundry detergent at home out of borax and washing soda. I said, oh, that's interesting. Well, let's, she had an iPhone. I said, well, let's look up borax and washing soda on Good Guide. And it was terrible. She was shocked. And, you know, this recipe is floating around the web like crazy. I just talked to someone else today who uses the same recipe. So uh, I think that the quality of information verifiability is going to be more and more important. I don't know how... We can do it except by putting out best practice standards. Good Guide is a completely transparent database. You can drill down, you can find the source of the rating, understand why it's there. I think the way 
to defeat bad information is to offer good information and to show that this is, the, let people know this is the sound information. Uh, okay. It's going to be busy night for you, Stacey. Uh, following on the same question, I want, also want to congratulate that there is a, an idea that there's progress. It's not about winners and losers, it's about better and better. How do we get better? Exactly. That's great, beautiful. Um, it, my question is, is since it's, this seems to be self-reporting from the companies, is that correct, if it is? And if so, how can you verify that the information provided by the companies is actually accurate? How can you verify that information from companies is accurate? And I turn the question over to our expert on companies' eco-accuracy. The remarkable thing is that uh, up until this point in time, consultants have sent questionnaires to companies for life cycle assessment, um, and they... Um, they fill them out and the, the consultants just have always hoped that the information was accurate. They can tell if there was a unit conversion error because this company's got a thousand times more or a thousand times less of the use than the other companies, but no one was checking to see if companies were just rounding down by 10% to look a little greener or if they all picked up the phone and said, let's all round down by 10% and we'll look, paper will be better than plastic. Um, and I guess it's because the economic stakes have been so low or not been as high as they are now, but with, with carbon footprinting and increasingly with ecological footprinting, uh, environmental and, and social health footprinting, that's all changed. And so uh, a, a central feature of Erster is you can publish, but until you've had an audit to validate that there's basically check the receipts on site um, to verify the numbers, verify the suppliers that you've, that you've linked to, until you've got that validation, uh, the data is, is shown as not yet validated, and it can't be used in a subsequent com uh, computation by someone else. So in other words, it's not just transparency, but verifiability. And, and Dara, on Good Guide, how do you handle the fact that companies don't reveal? What, what do you do with that? Right, so our, our strategy has been to uh, look to multiple data sources on any single issue. So. Uh, for instance, I have a six-year-old daughter, and we've been using a product called Johnson & Johnson Head-to-Toe Baby Wash, which is the number one selling baby wash. And their disclosure of their ingredients makes it look like a very good product. But working with some nonprofit groups that test those products, we found 1,4-Dioxane, which is a probable human carcinogen, in our baby wash, the one I use. So that is an additional layer of data that we add on for products, and we look to government data sources, but, but private wait, data sources. Are, are you saying that that carcinogen was a derivative, a right, byproduct, so rather than an ingredient per that's se? That's right. So in this case, Johnson & Johnson doesn't intentionally put 1,4-Dioxane in the product, but it shows up as a byproduct of an ethoxylation process. It's part of the manufacturing oh, process. Well, we all know ethoxylation process, yeah. right? I mean, so, duh, right, this is so, so clear. But that's Why right. didn't we think of that? No one, no one in the room would know, and um, the company doesn't disclose it, so we look for additional sources of data. Now, one of the things that's nice about Greg's system and systems that are growing in the kind of Web 2.0 world is that as we make this public and, and embrace Dan's radical transparency and put it out in public, First of all, educated people like all of us are checking this and looking at it and looking for mistakes or errors or lies. And then companies are spot checking their competitors. And so if Aubrey Organics says, sees that Avalon Organics is claiming something, they'll check and make sure that the data is right. And we can get some of this validation and verification through the crowd by just making it public. When it sits in a government database or an academic database or a corporate database, there's no verifiability. When you stick it out on the web and embrace radical transparency, you've got a very quick feedback mechanism to people gaming the system or outright lying or just not mentioning that they have these byproducts. Uh, Stacy, you, you're managing the mic. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Well, I'm certainly, oops, oh, sorry, no expert in life cycle analysis, um, but I'm glad to have some experts here because a little bit of reading I've done uh, it seems that there's, um, you know, depending on who does the analysis, they can come up with different answers of how they set the boundary conditions, how they assign numerical values to different impacts. I'm wondering if the models that are being used are getting better, if there's going to be some standardized protocols for doing life cycle analysis, and, you know, how is the field maturing so that um, you don't get radically different results from different people doing the same study? That's a great question. Um, so there, 
here again, uh, I think the web is going to help us a lot. First of all, there have been ISO standards, international standards for doing life cycle assessment comparisons since the mid-90s, or the late, uh, around 96 to 98 they came in. Uh, and they, they do set quite a, a good high bar for transparency in an individual study. But you can still have three different studies done, uh, and they might each make um, reasonable assumptions. They have to be peer-reviewed if the companies are going to make public claims. Peer reviewers might say, well, this is a reasonable assumption uh, to, to each of the studies, but they can come out with different results. And there, there are no, as, as a colleague of mine said one time in frustration, when a hired gun consultant did a bogus study, he said, where are the ISO police? How many people in the room knew there were ISO standards for life cycle assessment? How many people know what an ISO is? <laughs> oh, that's remarkable. Okay, well, it's a green MBA. Oh, green MBA, that's no wonder. Yeah. But that's cheating, really. <laughs> Other than the green MBAs, who knows? That's, that's an international... Uh... Standards organization, yeah. sorry. So uh, we, we have another idea, um, which we, we, it looks like we're going to get some funding to start, and it's to, cr it's to actually put the ability to calculate and publish your life cycle assessment comparison in the web as well. So that just as Dara said, when, when you put it up there in the web, now we can actually go inside, understand why they're getting different results, um, the finger, you know, the fact that, oh, well, that's a reasonable assumption, and now I see that that's what changes everything. Um, and, and, really, and, and also make it more democratic to be able to author life cycle assessments. In other words, it's a work in progress. Is that what you said? Basically. Yeah, it's a new field, and it's, and it's getting stronger as it goes. Uh, there's a hand here and a question here. Um, to me, this is about using your uh, com consumer purchasing power uh, to do earth justice. Um, what's important to me also is social justice. And I wonder if the good guys or um, earth earth have some way of um, just like a, a, a company that rating uh, mutual fund, you know, ABC, um, is there a way, let's say, you can evaluate, let's say, aluminum extracted from South Africa as opposed to, like, you know, Israel? Yeah. Uh, you know, how do you give it a number so that, because certainly the way it's extracted, not the same, you know, could be a lot of labor abuse, a lot of, you know, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. and. Um, as far as how early the science is, our health hazard assessment is, the, I think, the most solid scientific and most defensible. The environmental assessment is the second most. There's some debate about values and assumptions. The social impact categories are the most debatable and the most value-laden. But we have worked really hard in Good Guide to get that data in our system and then to allow people to personally determine, based on their personal ethics, what they care about. So, we um, have worked with the four leading research firms that provide data for socially responsible investment. Um, so KLD Research Asset for Risk Metrics Group and Innovest. To, they rate publicly traded firms for social issues, treatment of workers, the supply chain, the labor rights things. So we have that in our system and we allow people basically to filter for those types of issues and to find companies and products that match their values along those dimensions. Um, so we're very interested in getting that kind of data on social impacts. But the science of social impact assessment, and this is something I'll hand it off to Greg, there's a field moving from environmental life cycle assessment to social life cycle assessment, to understand the full impacts on workers, communities, consumers of the full life cycle of a product to understand its social impacts. Maybe I can hand over on That's a very, very early field. It, it, it's a, it's um, just two quick anecdotes on this that are important or, or, or things to mention. First, uh, in Dan's book, he interviews Catherine Benoit, who uh, is the lead editor on a, a document that's just being released this week, no, actually next Monday, through the, the U United Nations Environment Program's Life Cycle Initiative, and it's guidelines for, for practice on social LCA. So it's to really try and say, here's how we do it now, and let's all work to make this better. The other thing I'll note is, um, Erster was actually inspired by the challenge of doing social LCA. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I did that study where I found that 10% that of the supply chain was leading to potentially economic development impacts that would dwarf the pollution consequences. And I said, on the one hand, this is great news, but on the other hand, enough, a little research in, 
in uh, participatory development and participatory evaluation and things made me s so appreciative of the fact that the details uh, uh, drive everything and you could have drastic problems and we needed to empower, somehow we needed to empower ubiquitous bottom-up reporting and then aggregate it across supply chains. That was the, the origin of the Erster idea in 2004 and then after we got going we said, wow, this could also help our job on environment. This is um, terribly exciting and I'm just so, so excited to hear what all of you are saying. It sounds like you are, like this gentleman said, empowering the, the consumers to take responsibility for their purchasing power and putting that in the hands of the end user. And um, my, my wondering is, what are you hoping it, that the book will do? Is this kind of like the next ecological revolution to wake people up to the power that they have well, instead of trying to get the companies yeah. to change, get the consumers to change their buying habits? The, the book is essentially a manifesto saying we have to all collaborate to work together. Those of us who are shoppers, those of us who are in business need to understand that uh, the transparency, the shared knowledge of what the true impacts are empower both sides of the equation. They give an advantage to companies that uh, get the ecological upgrade first in their sector to the extent that you and I make it matter to them. So we all have to work together on this. Questions in the back. One in the front and then some in the back. Sure. So uh, I'm very appreciative of all this information. Thank you very much. Uh, a question is for companies that want to do the right thing and they have uh, processes in their life cycle uh, where they can see that we need to change this piece here or this ingredient there. Is there something uh, where maybe from your databases that they, they can find an alternative. I'm thinking, for example, of packaging for foodstuffs that's shipped all around the world. That It's impractical. It actually makes the product not uh, competitive if you uh, package it in glass, for example. And so it's being packaged in plastic. And then plastic isn't recycled in communities where it's sold, et cetera, et cetera. And these companies are looking for alternatives, ecological alternatives to practice plastic, but they haven't found anything. What, what can you offer in that regard? Go ahead. So uh, yeah, th that's, I think, exactly where we're hoping to move. We've started Good Guide to focus specifically on consumers and shoppers while you're making decisions. But the day after we launched, we got, started getting phone calls from manufacturers, both asking why they got the scores they did and why they were doing so badly, particularly green product companies that were surprised at their scores. The next question was, how do we find alternatives? We're now engaged with the California State Green Chemistry Initiative, which is moving towards a very large scale alternatives assessment process for identifying chemicals that are less toxic, better for the environment. And I think this really moving, getting the attention of manufacturers and retailers was, I think, critical. And this is something, I guess, really Dan has identified also. This is a key part of the movement, a key point of leverage getting it out in the open where you can identify the problems and then I also work to identify solutions and then learn from other people's solutions and then spread those solutions is really I think where it's moving. Um, we're very early in that process but I think a lot of thoughtful companies are now moving to that alternatives assessment work and hopefully they'll use it in a public form and not keep it as protected secrets but rather we'll spread it. In fact, I, I think that to the extent we make transparency count companies will start to want to reveal it because it's a competitive advantage. They're going to look better. And the ones who withhold information will start to be the bad guys. This is a question sort of bringing, bringing it home to Marin County. Um, I will admit that tonight my wife and I ate salmon that was supposedly fresh salmon that was farmed somewhere else and was probably flown here. And I'll also admit that this summer I'm going to take a trip to Europe that I don't really need to do. And what I, what I wonder is, is whether people getting into this kind of analysis would ever do such things. Um, people and, getting into I mean, this seri analysis. Seriously, like, like oh, the impression. You mean okay, let me tell you about having dinner with Greg in Cambridge last week. So I wanted to have fish. And, um, you know, I'm new to this. I'm just kind of learning, and these are my gurus here. So, so Greg takes out his 
cell phone and goes on the web and goes to blueocean.com. And I look up, uh, I wanted to have cod, scrod, which is cod. And it, Blue Ocean said, well, if you live on the East Coast, it's overfished. If you live in Marin, it's okay. Uh, so I went for the Arctic char. Arctic char is farmed on inland uh, fish farms, and so it doesn't uh, have the problems that a lot of ocean-based things. So, you know, it's, it's a matter of, first of all, don't feel guilty. We're all in this together. Uh, it, it, we haven't had the information. To the extent that we get it and can use it, we, we I think, can feel better and better about the fact that we're making a, a difference. And uh, I just got back from India. I flew. I'm trying to fly less. I live in Massachusetts. I'm here now. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot in the equation on any given trip. Maybe you really deserve that vacation, you know. But then there's, I, I can't make that decision for you. It's something each of us has to weigh. It, just an extra comment to this. People sometimes ask me, uh, don't you get depressed? <laughs> doing, doing the work you do. And, and oftentimes at the end of, uh, of, a, of a semester, I'll ask the students, now that you understand LCA, exactly as, as you said, sir, you know, we, we ate breakfast this morning, we, we put on our clothes, we drove or we did whatever. Would the planet be better off without us? And I, and I ask that question, and I, I, I say, raise your hand if you think. And unfortunately, most people raise their hand, and I say, imagine the... the Look at, the, at the, the, the blind spot, the hidden guilt complex that we're all walking around with. And then I ask, but does it have to be that way? What would we do to change that? And it's a pretty simple, in some ways a simple thing. We, we, um, we, we want to try and reduce our footprints as far as we can. And then we need to try and generate some positive benefit with our lives uh, that more than offsets the remaining footprint. I, I like to call that your handprint. So you, you want to have a handprint that's bigger than your footprint. A creative, positive Beautiful. change that more than offsets um, your, your, your footprint. And if we can just get Earthster out there and, and working fine, um, my next project is to, is to try and work with smart people like Dara to, to get a, a website and a, and a system available that can help us really operationalize that kind of net positive benefit living at the personal level, at the family, at the, at the college level, at the company level, et cetera. Just one quick story. When, when my team of, I have a team of both nerds and geeks. We're a diverse team on <laughs> our team. Um, when, we, when we did our first marketing thinking, we came up with the name of our site was all the horrible things that you're doing to the world and how your stuff's going to kill you, dot com. <laughs> And it was actually George Lakoff, the framing guy, who's a colleague of mine at Berkeley, said, you know what, you might want to do a positive frame here. <laughs> and he really helped us think about what, this, what we're really trying to do is not make people feel guilty, not make people feel bad about the meat they eat or the car they drive or whatever, but to show them proximal things that they can do that they can choose to do. And that as they understand their main impacts, they can make choices, either small or big, to change their life and hopefully also to send signals and to make demands and to make it so you can get whatever you want, the fish you want, in a sustainable way, if that's what you want. And so I think it really is about positive steps, not about feeling bad about these things. I can't help but think while you're addressing all of this, which is just you know fabulous, you're speaking to an audience that is sort of a, a different demographic than much of the world, I would say, and that we are you know very receptive to this. We're, we're probably more educated. Uh, want to do the right thing, we're very socially conscientious, but I can't help but wonder about the rest of the world who only wants to get, you know, the rock bottom price, they really just want to get what they need, they're only concerned about their own needs, really not about what's best for the, the future of our planet. And I'm just curious to know how, you know, how do you th address that, what do you think about that? And, and what do you, how do you anticipate um, this idea, you know, being received and moving forward? If you uh, look at surveys of shoppers and ask, uh, well, do you care about this, these kinds of issues, and would you go out of your way to get the better thing, uh, you find that about 
10% of shoppers generally are like people in Marin who really are passionate about this and, and want to do something. 25% say, uh, I couldn't care less. And the action actually is the two thirds in the middle who say, it turns out, if it were easy for me to know the difference, I would act on it. And that's where this is all going. Right now, you know, Good Guide is in a beta form, but already major retailers are talking about putting Good Guide ratings next to the price tag or on products. So what that does is make ecological impact uh, Im as important as price. And, you know, uh, I think eco-moms are going to drive the shift in the market because, <laughs> let's hear it for moms. Because, uh, you know, most shopping is done by women, and the most powerful data, I believe, is the health data, the toxins we're in the stuff we buy, and to the, and you know, you just don't want to, I don't care what your education level is or what your socioeconomic status is, you don't want that stuff for your kids. And if you can find out which is the, the good one or the better one and which is the bad one, you're going to go for the better one every time. And by the way, the good guide shows that with whatever your budget is, you can always find a better choice. This, you know, the idea we have to pay a premium for organic is marketing hustle. And to the extent that, you know, the, the Walmarts of the world and the big chains get on this bandwagon, and by the way, they are, you're going to see cost efficiencies you wouldn't believe for organics, for all the things that have been marketed as, as premium. So I think that we're going to crash that barrier and democratize this. I, w I want to thank uh, Dominican University and everybody for being here. And I really, this is one of the best things I've attended in quite a while. And I really would like to thank you, everybody, for uh, sponsoring this. I'd like to ask a uh, last question, I think. Is this the last one? Yeah. That's a tough one. Daniel, you've, I, I really have followed your work and everything. And to me, war is the ultimate polluter and destroyer of our planet. And my question is, and I know you can't answer this briefly, is don't we need more than eco ecological intelligence? Don't we need a total spiritual shift in human beings to not only prevent the destruction from companies, but to change a society around the world based on militarism, on the, on the destruction of the planet through the expenditure for military, military uh, arms and, and all of the rest of it, mm -hmm. and if we don't link this concern to a much broader sense of ending the military industrial complex that is booming around the world right now, today, that is growing at a massive rate, that all of this, unfortunately, will not save anything. Thank you. Yeah, I can only answer yes. <laughs> so thank you very much. The books are here. We'll be signing. <laughs>